Hey footy fans, welcome to the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast. I'm your host Dave and today we've got an absolute legend on the show. He's the Eels and Warriors uh, cold hero. It's the man, Mark Tukey. How you doing, big brother? G'day mate, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure, man. I'm doing great and um, I'm sure everyone else is doing fantastic now. I got you on the show. Uh, a lot of very happy people out there. Nah, it's good to be on here, mate. I love uh, doing these uh, podcasts. So um, yeah, far away than anything you want to know. All right, man, let's do this. Okay, so uh, a lot of people want to know, what is the great Mark Tukey up to these days post-footy? Mate, I'm uh, down on the Gold Coast. Um, I've been down here now for about five years, uh, living with the wife and, uh, yeah, just doing some disability support stuff for here on the Gold Coast. Um, been doing that now for about four years, so uh, really enjoying that very rewarding job. Um, I still run a little bit of... Um, Big Took Sports, so uh, we do we still do the marathons and the golf events and all that type of stuff as well. So I'm getting into the boxing as well now, doing a bit of promotion in that kind of area. Um, and, uh, yeah, still playing in a lot of these charity uh, rugby league um, games for, um, you know, Arthur Beetson Foundation. I'm doing a bit on that. We'll touch on that a bit later. But, um, um, yeah, and I um, just do a few other charity events, um, as many as I can, while the body still lets me. Yeah, man, that's the way. Uh, so you said you're doing a bit of marathoning. Are you actually running marathons or are you just getting people to run marathons? Uh, both. I've, uh, in the past, I've done eight marathons since retiring. Wow. Um, yeah, I thought I needed to get my ass into gear. So I uh, started doing a bit of training and, yeah, I've done eight marathons now. Um, I, in that, with that, I, I've run my own um, events business and we, we um, pr- put marathon events on as well. So I coordinate them and um, plan them and, uh, yeah, do all the timing and get the medallions and the shirts, et cetera, for that type of thing. So, yeah, it's a bit of, it's a bit of fun. Well, I'm a marathoner, so, uh, dude, I'm going to have to come over and do one one day. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let you do one for free, mate. Oh, that'd be good. I'm over in June <laughs> with, with the missus. Um, so, yeah. I'm over nice. Going. Yeah. That'd be good. <laughs> cool, man. Okay, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. Mark Tukey is a young fella. Where did you grow up? What was life like for you as a young lad? Um, I grew up, uh, I was born down in Sydney, um, to my, my mum was 14 when she had me. So, um, it, um, it was very, uh, um, early stages of life. It was a bit tough and, uh, you know, mum was still p- pretty much at school. So, um, we had a pretty modest upbringing, to be honest with you. We moved to Logan, um, or when I was about five or six or seven year old, years old, um, I ended up down in Logan and, uh, basically lived in Logan my whole life, went to Woodridge yeah. High School. Went to Woodridge uh, um, Primary School, um, and then yeah, I was lucky enough. Um, when I left school, I was lucky enough to get a contract with the Crushers, South Queensland Crushers. I see the shirt you got on there, so yeah, right. I got picked up uh, basically out of school, and uh, you know the rest is kind of history from there, really. Okay, so so you said you played for Logan, and there was another team you played for, sort of on your way to rep footy. Um, what was that other team you played for? Springwood Tigers. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at Logan and um Springwood had a um a premier grade team and Logan Brothers, um well, Brothers St. Paul's back then, um, they didn't quite have a, a premier grade team. So I went over to Springwood and did two years in Spring at Springwood. Yeah. Um, not many people actually know about that. I, I just kind of went there to to try and you know better my football career. And from there I actually yeah, got picked up uh, by a talent scout um named Brian Edwards, who's now yeah. at the uh, the Dolphins. So that's oh, where it all started, to be fair. Oh, that's cool. I love the Dolphins, by the way. Definitely. Uh, my, well, I like the Warriors of the Dolphins. But, so my dad's from Brisbane, but I'm Kiwi. So I get to go for both. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um, uh, so as a young fella, uh, what were you like as a trainer and what made you uh, fall in love with the game? Like, did You played from a young age, I imagine. Um, what was it that made you get yeah. back, you know? Yeah, I started. I started playing actually for a rugby league team when I was four years old. Oh, wow. um, it was it was Wayland United down in Sydney, and uh, the story goes, I used to chase my mate Shadow around. We used to race to the crossbar up the goalposts uh, <laughs> when I was four years old, and then by the time I got to seven, and I was actually in the under sevens, I was a bit of a gun by then because I'd had three years of uh, tackling the big boys, and yeah. Uh, so yeah, my pop was a coach. 
uh, my my stepdad was the coach was a coach of another team, and I used to play three games in one day, kind of thing. I'd you know fill in for all the grades above me as well once I hit seven. Um, and yeah, from then I uh, yeah I, I didn't miss a year. I, I play I played for my whole life basically. Oh, wow. So started at four. Wow, and and were you a good trainer as a young fella, or did you have to like really work hard? Um, how did it go? Oh, you? mate, I always had to work hard. I, uh, I've always had the good, a good training attitude. But um, yeah, I've always just loved food. I've always been a bigger kid. I was always a bigger kid. Um, and but I could run. I was, I could actually move uh, pretty well. And um, as I went through school, primary school, high school, I. You know, be finishing first, second, or third in the hundred, and I'd also wow. have a crack at the. In high school, I used to have a crack at the um, the two k, the ten k walk. Um, I'd do everything to get out of school. To be honest, yeah, you and me both, mate. <laughs> it was all about PE for me at school. <laughs> Absolutely, I used to compete in every event just because I was out of school. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, uh, so fast forward a little bit. You got selected for Queensland under seventeens. What was that experience like? And who were the players coming through around that same time uh, that you thought might go on to mm. bigger things? Yeah, yeah. So through uh, throughout my whole career, I played with the guys like Ben Eichen, oh, um, Darren Lockyer. Yeah. Those guys were in. They were the same age as me, um, and they were. But they lived kind of out, out. I'm like obviously Darren Lockyer was from up at um, Wandowan or something. So um, we used to kind of all come together. John Buddygig was another guy. Oh wow, um, Cowboys! I, I, I dealt a lot. Yeah. Yeah, big Butsy. I I billeted him in one about the under fifteens uh, rep side. He brought they he came down with the Townsville side to the state carnival, and yeah, we billeted him. So um, you know, I grew up, I, I played a lot of footy, and I knew uh, a lot about uh, big Butsy. Um, yeah. But yeah, those type of guys. Um, I'm just trying to think of who else was around there. Um, Oh, I played a lot with Carl Webb, obviously. Yeah. God rest his soul. Yeah. But um, yeah, those kind of guys were all around my era. Oh, cool. And so what was the experience like playing in that um, under-17 Queensland side? Was that like boosted you to the next level? Yeah, absolutely. So in the under, I think it was um, the next year. So under-17s, I had um, all those guys. I made the Australian um, side as well. And wow. we toured uh, Fiji. That was um, during the COVID, uh, no, sorry, uh, during Super League era. Yep. Yeah, so we couldn't play at certain parts of Fiji and we ended up playing over there. But we had, um, yeah, like I said, um, Darren Lockyer, they were all in my Australian side. We had a yeah. Trent Barrett. He was, again, his oh, wow. Barrett. Um, so we had a really good side. And, uh, yeah, just playing in that Queensland side was amazing. And what I found funny, the next year, Benny Iken went and played when we were all kind of 18. Ben Iken went and played for State of Origin. So yeah. the year before we were playing, uh, I was playing Origin with Ben Iken and the the next year he's up there in the big boys. So it was Crazy. really good to see him go on and do something like that. And and again, those kind of, we just enjoyed footy when we were back then, 17, 18. So it was, uh, you're playing with your mates and it was awesome. Yeah, man. So um, I bet not everybody knows this, especially Warriors and Eels fans who are more know you for those times of your career. But you you got um, your debut with the South Queensland Crushers, hence why I'm wearing the shirt today. Um, <laughs> so, so how did you get recruited to the Crushers? Like, tell us how that all happened, especially being in the Super League era, which I'm going to cover shortly. Um, yeah, yeah. How did you? How did you? How long have we got? How long have we got? Oh, as long as you want. I got all day. <laughs> no, nah, so. To, I'll, I'll try and do it as quick as we can. So as I, when I was at Springwood, we um we, we got put into about a hundred and twenty man Brisbane squad um for this uh, South Queensland Crushers development kind of system. Right. Um, there was 120 of us selected. There was 120 selected in the far north Queensland area as well. Yeah. Um, and so there's 240, and we had um separate camps and we went through all our paces they weighed us did speed test fitness test eye hand coordination test um oh yeah there was so much with i think they took some blood tests on lactic acid and all this kind of thing um they narrowed it down to 120 after that so they cut kind of 60 from each group they yeah. narrowed it down again we went and did more tests and i think we might have even had a trial a couple of trial runs um and that we they got it down to about 60 yeah. And th between the two groups, and then they brought us all together for one weekend or something like that, and um, they narrowed it down to I think thirty 
35 and I kept making the cut. Oh, nice. um, and the story goes, actually, one of the guys that was, uh, Mark Johnson was a, a guy that was working with the crushers at the time. He was, he was the one who kind of like said, this guy goes all right, you know, and, and, and uh, it, they kept having to reassure that the fat kids goes all right, you know, and uh, <laughs> so that there was a lot of uh, big, you know, muscly Adonis looking blokes back yeah. then as well. And they just kept, have to keep, um, saying uh, pick the fat kid he does all right so um yeah i got through a few of the uh few, jumped through a few of the hurdles and yeah finally got picked okay so that was uh like a development contract or was that straight into the crushers top squad no i um i signed a uh contract so it was just a um well i think we might have got two thousand dollars to play in that for the whole season oh, wow. um and then yeah i signed my first contract uh at the uh, at the end of 95 yep. and uh, I remember sitting next to David Miles and his mum and me and my mum and we signed a $5,000 contract um, for the to be in the NRL system I don't even think it was top 30 or anything back then so we yeah that was my first ever contract was a nice $5,000 nice work so like what's it like when you pull up to South Queensland Crushers trading for the first time there's the likes of Trevor Gilmister. And, you know, all these big guns, um, Dale Shearer is at the club at the time as well. Like, what's it like for... Yeah, absolutely. To that? We had Trevor Gilmeister, Mario was there as well, yeah. Mark Hone. Uh, and then um, that first year, so they were all legends of the game. Yeah. And then um, that first year in, I think it was 96 when I debuted, the, we had the five... Um, five players go on and play state of origin, the Nuffies. Um, and they went out and beat New South Wales three nil. So that was That's again right. when Ben Eich and Fatty didn't even know who Ben Eichen was in the in the lift. And uh but we had Craig Teven, Terry Cook. They all kind of made the origin side from yeah. the crushers. Craig Teven. Um so yeah we had um we had five uh, NRL leg um, origin legends in our team then and um yeah I was lucky enough to debut that year ninety six. Nice. Nice. So um so what were the things um, like that kept you coming back to training fired up? You know, you're a young fella, you know, you've got this opportunity. Was it, was that what was driving you to keep going to pursue like a professional career? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even during school, I uh, knew I wanted to be a professional rugby league player. Yeah. Um, probably didn't realise how hard it was to uh, get, get get to be a professional rugby league player. Um, but yeah, I just uh, I've always I always had the drive to train hard. I've always yeah. had to train hard to yeah. you know keep it stay ahead of the game. So I, the training part wasn't my problem. I used to love it, but it was hard. But I used to love it. I wasn't good at it, but I used to love getting out there and having a crack with the boys. Um, uh, but it was more around my yeah my food. Um, I had a bad relationship with food, to be honest with you, and uh, yeah. that was what kind of held me back a little bit. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, so I was going to ask, what? How did you get through preseason? Like, did like was it just grueling? Very, very, like, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'd, just, I'd almost love to be a fly on the wall and watch you get through a preseason training. Like, I hate training. But, like, I love running, but. The training you have to go through to get to a certain level is super tough. And I'm just a runner. Um, I, I just appreciate like what you would have to physically go through. Uh, yeah, well, let me just tell you, I am not a runner. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so running was uh, one of the hardest things that I I've ever, I have could ever have done. And pre-season training is all about running. So, yeah, yeah you could imagine the uh, challenges. Uh, there was lots of uh, chafing, uh, lots of blood, sweat and tears. Let me just say that. <laughs> James, think that's gold. Oh God. Um, okay, so I really want to ask you because you're in that perfect era of player that was in the Super League War. Um, that's one of my favorite questions to ask anyone who was involved in that. How did it affect you? What were your thoughts on the Super League split? Um, you know, go. Well, to be honest with you, I was uh I made the Queensland under 18 side the year of um the year of Super League War. So um we got offered Ten thousand dollars. Every player in the Queensland Under 18s yep. got offered ten thousand dollars to play um, for Queensland under the ARL. So right. if you wanted to make the Queensland side, they said you is ten thousand dollars. You can play. If you don't want to take that, and you want to go to Super League. Well, you're not playing in the Queensland State of Origin team. So we all just took ten thousand dollars. Well, that was kind of a it was a blanket kind of every player. Um, if I was a year later. 
I would have been on probably five hundred thousand dollars because yes, both both myself and Billy Weepu was another, another Kiwi front row. He was yep. at Manly. We were the two front rowers coming through in that era. Um, we were the next two guys ready. Well, um, down to play NRL basically, and uh, yeah, we just missed out. But yeah, I I actually went AR, obviously with the ARL because yep. I was at the Crushers. Um, Super League, yeah, it it. it it, it did its job. It kind of shook the system up a little bit, yeah. similar to what Liv's doing now with the golf, I believe. So, um, yeah, it had its place. Um, everyone was a winner in the end, and the um, you know everyone got a bit of money, and um, yeah. we all come back to reality and join forces, and the game is what it is today. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Everyone saw sense, um, and <laughs> that um, also worked out for you because 1998, you signed with the Parramatta Eels. So obviously the crushes folded. So how did how did that affect you? Like, were you left without a club? Uh, did you have the Eels deal already signed? Um, how was that process for you? Yeah, well, during that last year that the, the Crushers folded, they announced that they were folding. They couldn't pay us any more money. They ran out of everything. So we actually had to go and fundraise because I was in the under-21s President's Cup team and uh -huh. we uh, won the grand final that year against Parramatta. So oh, wow. while all the clubs folding around us and we were still trying to win a premiership uh, with the, and we ended up beating Parramatta in the in the grand final, oh, on grand that. final day. So, you know, real fond memories there with that. We were the last team to win the President's Cup. The South cool. Queensland Crushers under 21. So, oh, good. Um, yeah. So while all that was happening, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't remember the timing, but um, yeah, I got we got an opportunity, and um, me, Troy Pizet, and um, Clint Chikowski oh, all basically good. were targeted by um, Parramatta, and we yeah got a deal. Oh, he was a gun player, old Clinton. He was great. Um, <laughs> yeah, he ended up at the Raiders, didn't he? Yeah. He did, yeah. He did. Um, okay, so you, you made it to the Eels for 98. The NRL was born, and basically you became a cult hero at Parramatta. Everybody loved you. What was it like having the crowd chant your name every time you took out the ball? Yeah, absolutely. It started at the Crushers, to be honest with you. The crowd kind of cheered it up. And um, at, the, at the end of the day, I look back on it, and I was just a player that didn't fit the mould of, uh, you know, um, six-pack and and ripped up and and lean and mean. So I had a little bit of fat on me. I was a little bit rotunders uh -huh. and a bit rounder. And um, I used that to my advantage, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, they, they couldn't get, get, get me down quite easily enough. So, yeah, I just get off the back fence, get up a head full of steam and uh, well. crash into someone. And uh, the crowd seemed to like it. And, uh, yeah, I could hear them chanting it. And it's awesome. Yeah. I loved it. Um, I remember the first time they did it at Parramatta, my mum's kind of like, why are they all booing you? Like, why are they? And I'm like, mum, nah, it's, it's Tukey, the surname. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it now. So, um, but, yeah, it was uh, it's, uh, it was awesome. And, again, I think the game's kind of losing those kind of crowd um, favourites. Um, yeah. You know, Foy Foy Moy Moy was another one that comes yeah. to mind and big Fekka Paliasena. But yeah. uh, other than that, yeah, they, they, it's really – and maybe Georgie Rose there I was, was say again. Georgie Rose. Yeah. Just those guys that don't, don't fit the mould of the Adonis yeah. Rugby League player. So, um, yeah. but, yeah, no, it's uh, – it it was really good. I loved it. Yeah, it used to astound me watching the likes of yourself and George Rose. Like, I couldn't believe the motor you guys had on you, like the minutes you could play. And you actually had some pretty good twinkle toes, if you ask me, a little bit of a side step. I know you scored a couple of tries, stepping some fellas before the lineup at your Warriors days. Yeah. That was just out of fear, mate. I was just getting out of their way. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really have too much of a side step. Uh, it's called it a swerve. Yeah, we'll call it a swerve. We'll go with that. <laughs> so, yeah, 98, you had an amazing season at the Eels. Um, you finished fourth on the ladder. You had 10 starts, seven off the bench as well. And you actually beat the eventual premiers twice, sort of towards the, the middle and back end of the season. Um, but it was against, uh, in the semi-final, 15-10, uh, you beat the Broncos. And, um, but, and, and you sort of became a bit of their bogey side. Like, what was it like getting up? And knocking over the Broncos twice in the season. Yeah, we uh we had Brian Smith was our coach and he he was a very smart operator and we uh, I remember that I remember playing the Broncos every time with Parramatta. We yeah we beat them all the time yeah. and um we just went in with a game plan. They had two wingers. They had Lottie Takiri and Wendell Saylor. Darren Lockyer at the back. They oh, had yeah. like they had strike power everywhere. Ran off and everyone like that. So we just kicked the ball out. 
That's what we did. We, we'd get to the end of our set, kick it dead, kick it yep. into touch. So whenever they were restarting their sets, that was a, from a scrum or from a tap. So uh-huh. it was a, it was a, it was a steady restart rather than an active rolling one. So yeah. we just had a really smart game plan and we executed that pretty well. And um, yeah, and we, and we had some good, we had a good team as well. But um, yeah, Absolutely. the Broncos just couldn't couldn't beat us. <laughs> so I remember the likes of uh, John Simon, I think Stuart Kelly. And Jason Smith, they were just in sublime form sort of towards that back end of the season. I remember they really stood out in those particular matches against the Broncos. Remember John Simon? I think some of the best footy he ever played was for you guys at that stage. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, mate. I played with him at the Warriors as well, yeah, mate. He's an strong. absolute legend, Johnny Simon. But when I went down to Parramatta, I was uh, I was like a new front rower. I took I actually came down to Parramatta because um the fellow with the had the brain um brain injury the big uh what was his name I'll, I'll think of it in a minute but right. we had um Dean Pay, Jason Smith, Jim Dimmick, yep. Jared McCracken, yep. Mick Vella, oh, Nathan sweet. Highmarsh, Nathan Kalis, me so <laughs> this was our pack you know and throw Brett Horstall in there um yeah so we had a gun we had a gun pack I remember going there as kind of you know I've, I'd played kind of 10 or 15 NRL games by then yeah. um I'm like like look what I'm standing here with, and these guys were all my heroes. So, yeah. um, to be alongside Dean Pay and those boys in the middle there, it was just uh, you know it was it was pretty easy to be honest with you. It was you yeah. know we're, you, when you got all those guys around you doing it pretty easy. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant! So you guys made the prelim against the Bulldogs after knocking over the Broncos, and it seemed like you guys had the match sewn up at eighteen two with like eleven minutes to go or something like that. And unbelievably, the Bulldogs ran in three quick tries. I'll never forget it. It's one of the it's one of the standout finals matches I've ever seen. I know you were on the losing side in the end, but like, what was it like? You know, watching Daryl Halligan knock these conversions over from the sideline, and well, what was the the talk behind the posts? Like, what's going on there? Well, I was actually I was on the bench when all this was happening. Actually, I I come off with about fifteen to go, right. and, and history has it, mum was mum was ringing all all my relatives. Let's go, we're off to the grand final. You beauty, <laughs> up by twelve or something, and yeah. Uh, Daryl Halligan actually kicked that one to tie the game yeah. from right in front of our bench, and we're just sitting there behind it, and it was never going to miss. We could see it from behind, and. We're like you bastard, and yeah. uh, and then uh, yeah, and then once they once they drew with us, it went to extra time. Yeah, they put us, they put ten on us. I think in in the five each way extra time. So um, yeah, we'd kind of fired all our bullets. We couldn't stop the momentum, and big yeah. Yeah, DJ was on fire like always. Yeah, it was um, Craig Polamanta. It's the one game I remember from his career. He just went crazy in that last ten yeah. minutes, and then extra time. I've never seen him play like such a good game in his yeah. career. You know, Paul Carriage did that chip and chase and uh, <laughs> Polamana potted it, nearly potted the field goal from 55. Yeah, right. It went under the crossbar. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, poor old um, Paul Carriage has never lived that down, I don't think. Uh, it still scars him now. You know, when I was doing a bit of research for this, his name was the one name that popped up about that match. <laughs> Basically, he lost the yeah, game. Paul Badrin, it wasn't his fault. <laughs> no. Oh, it's unbelievable. But, uh, that was a hell of a game. Um, so... We'll put a line through that. We'll go to 1999, and you guys, um, you had another amazing season. You finished um, second on the ladder. Second on the ladder. Absolutely yeah. cruising. Knocked out by uh, the Storm, was it? Yeah, you got knocked out by the Storm, who, the team that just wouldn't go away. You know, they'd always be down at half time, and they'd just find a way to come back in the second half. And you guys fell victim to that in the semi final again. So, uh, oh, I think it was the second round of the playoffs, sorry. And, uh, yeah, the Storm went through and obviously won the grand final. So what was the feeling like through the squad in that season? Like, you guys were, like, you were up the top. Yeah, we were, uh, we were, we were good. We were a good team. We knew we were good. Um, everything, we, we had a, we, everything went to plan other than, you know, we just got uh, rolled at the last hurdle every time. But, um, yeah, we had a well-rounded squad. Like you said, um, we had a couple of players in a few positions that were probably the best in the competition at the time. You know, Jimmy Dimmick, and that was at the top of his game playing lock. And Jason Smith, I think, was at 5'8 at the time as well. So, yeah, we had some, uh, we had a real we we red hot side. But, um, yeah, Melbourne Storm, they, they had um, really, they had a really good side as well. They, they had Glenn Lazarus and all that back yeah. in those days. And Even Rodney Howe was... Oh. Like on fire that year as well. So yeah, um, 
you know, those games, you just, you know, you they go 50-50 and you either get them or you don't. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we, I had two really good years at Parramatta. The the fans down there were amazing. Um, you know, I um, I met some, I, one of my best mates, John Wilson's from, well, I met him at Parramatta as well. He works now at the NRL. So, um, you know, I've made some lifelong friends down there. And obviously I'm, that's where I first met Daniel Anderson as well. So right. I've been lucky enough to, you know, have some good friends from down at Parramatta. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, Johnny Simon, um, he left mid-season to go to the Warriors and then you linked up with him for the next season. So how did that all come about? Why did you leave the Eels? And what was it about the Warriors? Like, why did you go to the Warriors? Because most players, when they get offered contracts, they go to the Warriors, especially good Australian players. They're not on your life. Like, why the Warriors? Yeah. So the story goes, when I um, signed with Parramatta, there was an option for me for the third year. And uh, Brian Smith come to me at one training session. And he said, oh, can we have a chat? And he pulled me aside and he said, mate, we, uh, we're we not going to take up that option for that third year. And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. I think it might have been 100 grand. I'm not too sure. Uh, so I'm like, oh, okay. And I didn't really know what to do. I'm like, oh, so what do I do now? Do I... Am I free to look around or what happens? And he said, Yeah, mate, yeah, no, you're free to look around, uh, you know. But um he and his and his um reasoning for it was that this was when the um unlimited interchange was coming in. Right. Um before previous to that, I would just come on and off willy-nilly. Um he said the games are gonna change. Yeah. yeah, the game's going to pass you by because, um, you know, it's going to be unlimited in the change and you've got to have some sort of stamina now and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I I contacted my manager and basically said, mate, what's, what's going on now? And um, oh, I don't know what the time frame was, but um, Hugh McGarn had made contact with my manager and said, um, we want to have a chat. And so I actually met him in the city somewhere down in Sydney. Um, yeah, we just had a chat and kind of looked, um, talked about you know, signing with the Warriors, and we, and I and I didn't really talk to any other club from that time mm-hmm. after Paro, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then, um, I think it was might have it must have been around Origin time, maybe, um, or, or we had a buy or something like that, and um, the Warriors flew me and, and my family over to New Zealand and my manager to um have a look around. Mm-hmm. basically see what's going on over there and have a chat. When we got over there, they wind and on us a little bit and um, took us up the Sky Tower and everything like that in New Zealand. And then um, then come to my manager and said, what's it going to take for him to sign uh, before we before you leave the country? And we're like, wow. oh, gosh. So we they basically put it in our court and me, and me and the manager sat down and went, well, we need this, we need that. And yep. we put a you know a bit, bit of cream on top and uh, yeah, they right. went, yep, done. <laughs> <laughs> they said you, you, we'll sign you so i signed there and then basically wow i can't believe there's no interest from other clubs or did they or did you just go first dibs on the warriors for showing interest first yeah well i never went to market no it was kind of not yeah. known uh, that i was on the market um uh the warrior uh, the warriors just uh human gun just touched base with my manager i think i believe my manager uh, jim bennigan at the time he um had some players at the warriors already right. um so they were probably in in contact a bit more anyway and uh but yeah it all happened pretty quick mate i could not believe it uh because you know big a warriors fan uh back then like i was i was probably at work listening to it on the radio and i'm hearing the guy who the crowd always chanted for, Mark Tuki, you know, he's coming to the Warriors and I couldn't believe it, you know. So I was like, <laughs> what a massive sign. And Ivan Cleary had signed and you had Scott Coxon and Matt Spence and David Miles and Benny Lyons. Yeah. And, you know, there were some good players. Scott Prethebridge, they were all coming over with you. So I thought, holy crap, the Warriors, they've signed really well here. They're looking pretty good for year 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Jason Deeth and Robbie Mears, yeah, uh, they were already here. Already yeah, there. so there was a few. Um, yeah, there was a few good boys over here. Yeah, man. So we had a really good side actually in two thousand. It was good. Yeah, you did. I, you guys had like really high expectations actually from the NRL and the and the Warriors fans and the NRL in general. Um, but you know, you arrive in New Zealand. What was it like coming to New Zealand? Were you nervous? Uh, and what was it like coming to a new country? <laughs> Do you want me to tell you the truth? Oh, I'd love to hear the truth. I'm not sure whether I just signed or agreed to sign or or not, but I'd watched Once Were Warriors yeah. very recently in that year, and I'm like, I was expecting <laughs> yeah, I to come over there and see facial tattoos, <laughs> Maoris everywhere, killing people and everything like that, and I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, what am I, what's going on here? Yeah. And when I arrived, I stayed at Mangadi out there at the airport. Yeah. And... um. 
there was nothing like it. It was <laughs> there was a lot more puckier white people, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is this, this is New Zealand. So yeah. um, I soon learned about you know South Auckland and the areas and where it was made and everything yeah. like that. But um, yeah, the first time we actually got over there very very early November, maybe even late September. Oct- yeah. oh, sorry, October, late October, and uh, because uh, I had Scott Cox and, and uh, David Miles with me. Yep. And we went down to the pub to put on our bets for Melbourne Cup Day on the do. first Tuesday yep. of November. Yep. Yeah, well, that's when we saw the crate of beer with tallies on the <laughs> – and we're like, oh, my God, this is once a warrior. Yep. So we uh, we just kind of put our bets on and got out of there quick yeah. smart. <laughs> and, uh, that, again, we were just Aussies, never seen none of this before, none of this heritage right. type stuff. So we were just like we're spinning out. And, um, yeah, but – Never had any trouble, not one bit of trouble while I was in New Zealand ever. It was uh, such an amazing place. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, that was uh, a question from uh, Charlie Rass. You really want to know your first impression. Charlie Rass. I know, big Charles. Uh, There you go. (laughs) (laughs) So you're you're at the Warriors. Were the Warriors coaches tough on you? Because you would have had uh, Mark Graham in your your first season. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's hear about it, man. What was Mark Graham like with Mark Tukey? So Mark Graham, mate, he was an absolute legend of the game. He was an absolute legend of a bloke. Yeah. Um, my memories of Mark Graham were him having a dart on the sideline, having a smoke while we're getting smashed, flogged. And uh, when we're hurt and he's laughing at us. And uh, it was a rough year that year. We didn't do too well no, um, we didn't. the first year. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was a great bloke. Uh, as far as coaches go, he was a tough bugger. Yeah. Um, but I've had better coaches than Mark Graham, but he was a champion of a bloke. Yep. Did he um punish you guys? Like, because I know that you had a couple of massive losses, like some fifty point drubbings. Uh, there was <laughs> at least one I remember. Like, did he like punish you guys for that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We'd get smashed every time. Yeah, and he'd <laughs> take pride in loving it. No, uh, we had um. There was a couple of really good trainers there too. As um, there was Trevor. Oh, what was his surname? There was a yeah, there was Trev was there and um and Sam Panapa. Okay. The old uh, Kiwi great as well. Yep. Sam I think that no, wasn't Sam Stewart. There was yeah, th- there was the two trainers there and they used to just flog the hell out of us. That was back when you used to, you know, do four hundreds and the, the <laughs> science hadn't really crept into the game just yet. So right. yeah, we we're still getting punished a lot. But um yeah, that was part and parcel of the off season. Okay. So I got another fan question, uh, which fits in perfectly around here from Stephen Conroy. He'd like to know uh, your thoughts on when the Warriors trimmed you down in weight and how it changed your playing style. Yeah, well, yeah, the Warriors, yeah, they everyone tried to trim you down. And <laughs> what I found when I trimmed down, so let's define trim down first. <laughs> I, I, I played mostly at around about 118 to 120. And right. when they trimmed me down, I'd get down to about 114, 113. Yeah. Um, when, I was that, when I was around that 113, 14, I was a little bit too light. Um, I was very mobile. I was more mobile than what I was, um, but I was a little bit light and I just lost all my bump and all my power. Okay. I wasn't a very strong as um, you know, in comparison to the weights numbers um, than some of the boys. But um, so I used to really rely on my weight to bounce a few players around. So I just lost that, that ability to, you know, a, a bounce a few off and get through the line uh, a little bit. Um, whereas if I had that, if I was about 118, I'd be a little bit less agile, but you definitely had a bit more steam and a bit more power to get through the line a bit. So, yeah, so you could skid all Thanks for that uh, question, Steve Conroy. Uh, I do a bit of coaching with him at the uh, Titans disability side. So, oh, yeah, uh, he's a good mate. Okay. So, uh, end of 2000, you guys have had a little bit of a shocker of a season. I think you just avoided the spoon by like one win, something like that. Um, but the Warriors actually like fell on their sword. They basically dissolved as a club. You've got no contract. There's no money. There's no coach. There's no gear. How was that for you, man? Like, what did you go through? Man, this was hectic. So I was getting married uh, for the first time at that stage, and uh, they stopped paying us for three months or two months or something. And I'm like, oh my god, I had a wedding to play for and everything like that. While all that was going on, all our basically the whole Warriors team was in the Kiwi side. So they were yeah. in England. So we couldn't even communicate and uh, see like what's going on. So um, our, all our boys were at, like Logan Swan, Stacey, all those yeah. boys had gone away with the Kiwis. And we were in Australia, gone, like gone home for Christmas and all the other Aussies as well. And we're like, and we had a stalemate because uh, the Tainui went broke. 
yeah. or they yeah they yeah so they um rescinded the club, and we're like well, we did that. What was going on? No contracts. All contracts were null and void because Crazy. they hadn't. So we no one knew whether we had to leave the club, find another club. Or stay strong. We're gonna, you know, all come back together. No one kind of knew anything, wow. and then um, so, and we're kind of in contact with our managers. Like, what's going on? No one knew anything. This went on for weeks and months, yeah. and then eventually, a part, well, the, the long the story goes that um, they got hold of Stacey over there in New Zealand and uh, a couple of the influential guys. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe Logan might have been in there as well, and maybe one of the, and Nigel Wagner maybe I don't know. And uh, they kind of were the first ones to go right. Oh, we'll get back on board yeah. with this new venture or something going on. So then, we, then all the cards started falling into place again. So. We all kind of re-signed. We all had to sign you. So, like I said, I signed a really nice deal with uh, Hugh McGann yeah. for a three-year deal, and I only got through about eight months of the good deal, and then I had to renegotiate. So, oh, nice. uh, but yeah, it was all a bit of turmoil, a bit of craziness going on. Yeah. Um, sense prevailed in the end, and I yeah. think um, that's when um, uh, Eric Watson came in, you know, brought a club on its knees, and yeah, turned it around. So, yeah, yeah it was interesting times. Let's say that. Yeah, did you find it quite stressful, like with just your home life and everything? That must have been tough, man. Absolutely, yeah. I was an Aussie living in New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, where we're going with this, but um, yeah, like I said, it's all kind of part of the history. It's made, makes you who you are, and um, you know, there's always a few um, bumps in the road on the way through. So this was just one of them. Yep, uh, well played. So 2001 kicks off. The Warriors rec- recruited the likes of Kevin Campion and a, a few other players came in that year, but you guys finally beat the Broncos for the first time. Like, how was that celebrated as a club? Also, I know the whole country was in raptures. 13 12, you little oh, well, Let's just say the Mad Butcher made a poster for us. Uh, we uh, celebrated in the uh, sheds, and there's a real pretty good photo with us all on the beers and everything going crazy there, and champagne bottles were. But yeah, that was the first time we beat them, and we beat them pretty well, too, I think. Um, yeah. We had a really good year that year. We, um, did. Eric Watson now uh, came in and really just changed the attitude of everybody mm-hmm. um, at the club. Um, we had a really good uh, mix, skill mix of young, talented Kiwis with the Ali Lautidis and that now were, you know, a year older in NRL kind of standards. Um, and like you said, we brought Campo and he brought um, a whole different um, concept around the training. You know, it was really hard school, tough. Yeah. No one got let off the hook, you know. So um, our discipline was really good in that off season. We trained really hard and, you know, we got the rewards really. Absolutely did. Because I remember um, in the year 2000, I think the likes of Francis Malley, Clinton Torpy and Henry Fafili, they sort of got blooded into the Warriors squad. Um, I remember it was a game against the Sharks in 2000. You guys beat them. And I remember the likes of Fafili had a pretty decent day out, uh, scoring a try or two. And that was like the start. And then 2001, they really kicked on the likes of um, Fafili, Mali, Torpy coming from the back. They were unbelievable. And then Ivan Cleary steadying yeah. the ship at the back. Yeah. Yeah, we had a really, we had a brilliant back five, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. they were on fire. That was during the uh, try celebration uh, era. And yeah. Uh, yeah, they were breaking open coconuts and listening <laughs> to music on the, yeah. So, so they had a really, and that was, again, that that kind of time in rugby league is when the wingers were wedging in and just absolutely um, killing uh, centres and yeah. taking their, you know, taking them out like big, big time. So, and now uh, the, the, our two wingers love doing that. So, oh, you yeah. know, Francis Melly uh, has got a pretty good highlights reel with some big shots does was it him who um smashed brent tate's neck i'm pretty sure it was i think it could have yeah been. it probably would have been him yeah because yeah. yeah, he was doing a killing a lot of them out there well <laughs> wide <laughs> yeah the highlights they were doing it for of, fun there at sunstein yeah brent tate's highlights are really being smashed by francis mouth it's pretty awesome <laughs> getting folded <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it um so you guys made the playoffs for the first time like finally, long-suffering Warriors fans. They've gone from on their knees to in the playoffs. Not quite sure how you managed to turn that around in one year. That's amazing. Like absolutely amazing. And you guys come up against your old side. Uh, you got towelled, but what was it like playing for the Warriors in their very first playoff match? Yeah, well, we um we got. I think it was the second last round of the season. We play Melbourne in Melbourne. You did, and now uh, we have to we have to win that game to finish in. I think it was eighth place or seventh or eighth place. Like we had to limp in, yeah. and um, uh, Melbourne scored on the hooter yeah. uh, to uh, to um. I think it was either draw the game or it was just to draw be down the by game. two. 
Still yeah, and then they had the kick from the sideline, yeah. and uh, and he missed it. So uh, I think it was Matty Guy who missed it or something. That's so we like, well, yeah, we, that's how we scraped through. I remember that. Then I remember our last game was against the Cowboys, and we had to try and back up from the emotional high of making the semis for the first time, knowing that this game against the Cowboys is just a nothing game. We were yeah. we were in about semi-finals, so it was uh yeah, it was a roller coaster year that year for sure. But yeah. um yeah, lots of highs in that year. We um yeah, like I said, we were very successful and the crowd just went our, our supporters just went nuts. They um they've been crying out for the Warriors to be successful and we were lucky enough to be a part of that one on the first the first year that they made the semis and then obviously the grand final. So yeah man. Yeah so let's go to 2002. Uh, pretty amazing season. Like minor premiers, just scoring tries from nowhere. Ali Altidi's on fire. Stacey Jones just had his, obviously his best season in my opinion. He was unbelievable. The whole team was on fire. Um, I, I, I always remember you and Kevin Campion embracing, you know, that that piece of footage when you beat the Sharks. You know, you're going to the grand final in a Warriors. Yeah, year. I just think. That speaks volumes. Like, what was it like for you, man? Like, we'll talk a bit more about the game, but what was that moment like realising you're, you're going to the grand final? Oh, yeah, you know, I just got goosebumps. So, yeah, we're talking about it. It's, yeah, uh, yeah it's a emotional. It was an emotional time. Um, just the whole the whole event um, going to that Cronulla game, um, Eric had just purchased 30,000 tickets for yeah. expat Kiwis that live in Australia, just present your passport and you get two tickets or something like that. So Amazing. when we went, when we got to the game, there was, we had two to one in the crowd. It was just, and it was a Cronulla home game. It was just like surreal. And um, before the game, there's like, we, there was about 15 huckers going around the whole yeah. stadium. And like, we're just sitting there watching the game before and there's, there's, there's there was uh, huckers going on everywhere and um, there was flags and everything. So uh, we definitely had the momentum um, going into that one. And um, yeah, just at the end of the game, like we, we were, we played pretty good in that game too. Yeah. I, um, Motu Tony, I think um, scored a try in the corner and yeah. toops and that. So yeah, we, um, yeah, with the emotion and just the relief, that we got there, you know, it yeah. was because uh, the hype back in New Zealand, the hype was like crazy. Like, is huge. this our year and all that stuff? And yeah. we've finally done it and all this. So, um, yeah, and we we come back um, straight after the game. I, I think it was I think it was straight after the game. Might have been the next day. And there was about five or ten thousand people at the airport. Right. You know, like it was. Uh, they had to uh, usher us through a tunnel because there was like people everywhere. They were going ballistic. So, um, the the memories of that was crazy. Then. For the grand final, they put out a thing over the news and everything. Don't go to the airport. We'll we'll bring the players back to the back to Ericsson Stadium. <laughs> so we they, they all come. Kind of, well, they still had a couple of thousand at the airport, but yep. most of them went back to the um stadium after the grand final. But yeah, that that one that Cronulla game was the game that you know I remember most. I don't remember too much about the actual grand final. To be honest, it was a bit of a blur that whole week. So yeah, so um. There's two moments I want to talk about in that shark game. One, Stacey Jones makes like a bit of a line break and then kicks her head for Francis Malley, who sprints down the field. And I think it's Paul Mello kicks the ball out of his hands as he's about to pick the ball up and score. And my heart like <laughs> jumped out of my chest. What was it like for you guys? I thought he was going to score for all money. Yeah. Oh, mate, honestly, I don't even remember that type of stuff. <laughs> it was, uh, the games were so quick. I was probably just breathing heavy back on the, back under the goal base, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I do remember, I do remember that vaguely. Uh, and then the other one too was um, when Carlo scores a try. That was the other moment. Uh, off I the other kick. <laughs> the big Johnny Carlo, yeah. So I actually chased that kick as well, believe it or not. And he, <laughs> he was just about 10 metres too fast for me. <laughs> How good was John Carlo that season? I reckon that goes right under the radar, and it annoys me because he was such a good player that season. Came from nowhere, you know. He was a fine NRL player, been to a few clubs, but I've never seen him play such a solid season. And and yeah, that's kind of just yeah. disappeared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where he went after that, to be honest with you. Yeah, and dragons. I still don't even know where he is now. So, yeah. but yeah, I uh, yeah, he was definitely a good player. Yeah, man, he was unreal. Okay, so grand final. We've got to talk about the grand final a little bit. You know, it's kind of the biggest moment ever. So you, what was the week like? You had Billy Idol, you're training on the field with Billy Idol singing in the background. Like, Do you remember much of the week at all? Oh, yeah, I remember the week. Um, it was, uh, it was, there was not much footy training going on. Um, we, we came back after the Cronulla game. Um, 
and then we basically had recovery and then a media session uh and then we had to get back on the plane i think we might have had a, a might have been a massages and all that type of stuff got all the media done mm-hmm. had to get back on the plane to go to the grand final breakfast on a thursday um and then i think thursday afternoon we had our only one session for the whole week yeah um maybe we did uh some weights and then friday might have been the captain's run um and then grand final basically so yeah uh, and then there was more media and all that type of stuff so it was pretty hectic um it was a pretty hectic week um build up to the game that's for sure and yeah. again lots of media stuff and um yeah. A lot of you know, a lot of hype talk and stuff. David Tour actually come over as oh, our uh, mentor. He right. was uh, yeah, come and spoke to us on the day before the game, I think, or the night before the game. And yeah, so we had a few um, inspirational kind of people come hanging around with us at the time. I mean, so you started the grand final, didn't you? I think you did starting prop. Yeah, I uh, believe it or not, uh, I I received the first kickoff and oh. I returned the ball. The I, I, again uh, until I watched the replay, I didn't even remember it. <laughs> to be honest with you, so I'm like, oh, really? I, I didn't really, I, I didn't, I can't even remember, oh, yeah. like that being a being a thing. But yeah, they kicked off to me, and I yeah, I started the, in the grand final. Nice, nice. So what was it like? Honestly, what's it like running out to this ridiculously full stadium, hearing the crowd? What I mean, you dream of that as a kid, right? This is the moment. Like, what's it like? Mate, there was eighty two thousand people there, oh, and uh, like I've never played in front. I, I think the Cronulla game was forty six or something, yeah, and then there was eighty two thousand, absolutely full stadium. Uh, again, um, even when we come off the bus to get into the ground, there's just thousands of people everywhere. You know, high five and you're wanting an autograph and everything like that. And then um, the thing that I remember most was we standing there on the on the staring into the crowd. Um, we're all kind of looking for our families and things like that. But when that both anthems were sung, we could feel the v- vibration on your skin, like it would it would reverb around you. And I've never felt anything like that before. And it was just the whole the whole um, scenario. And we we're standing out there in front of eighty thousand people, all singing the New Zealand national anthem and the Australian one. It was yeah. just um, yeah, something to remember. And then obviously, yeah, the game. Um, yeah, I, I received the kickoff, returned the ball, and the game with the rest is history. I mean, you guys were right in the fight to it when you to go. I mean, just before half time, Francis Smelly was unlucky to not to to pick up that beautiful kick from Stacey Jones in the corner. Oh, who was the fullback um, from the Roosters? Oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my Todd head. Byrne? No, it wasn't Burn. It, it was Skinny um, Burn. It wasn't Burn. He was on the wing. It was their fullback. Was I can't remember wing. off the top of my head, but uh, he was yeah. quite an underrated fullback because Mullins was on one wing, Burn was on the other. And you had Higgity. And Hodges with the two centres. And mm-hmm. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the fullback. Yeah, like, I can picture him. Is it not Reeves? No. Was it someone Reeves or something no. like that? No. No, anyway. He, he, I can he picture saves him. the day. He, he, he saves yeah. the ball. Melly doesn't get the try. But then, obviously, the great Stacey Jones try off the great Jerry CSU try assist. <laughs> and, uh, um, what a try. What was that like? How did, how did the team, what was the team chat after that try? Oh, uh, we were, we just knew we were in the arm wrestle. We just we were we were never complacent or comfortable <laughs> at all. We all just knew that you know we're in this we're in the arm wrestle now. Yeah. Um, you beauty, we got, I think we hit the lead there eight six yeah, or something did. like that. So yeah. um um yeah, it was just game on for basically for us. We, yeah. It was a tough day at the office, and the Roosters that year were renowned for their line speed. They'd get up in your face and just try and bash you. So, um, you know, we were just trying to weather that for the whole game, to be honest with you. And, you know, the 40-20 by Brad Fittler was probably the um, the game changer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know they got the penalty and, the, you know, the, uh, he got hit across the eye by with Villasani and Wairangi Korpu and that. But um, he kicks a 40-20, they score off that one, yeah. puts them back in front. And we, again, couldn't stem the momentum, really. Yeah, Fitler yeah. turned it on, to be honest. Yeah, Craig Wing, he really stepped up. Uh, Flannery. Oh, <laughs> oh Fitz, Fitzgibbon, another one. Like They all just sort of... They had a good side. Uh, score and tries. Yeah. You know, going into the final, when it was against the Roosters, like, that's the one side I didn't want the Warriors to be playing. Same in 2011 when they played Manly. It's like, well, where's a bogey side? You know, it's like, because the Roosters' <laughs> defence was unreal in 2002. I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's the side that's hard to score points against, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, nah, they're a good side. What's it like going into battle with Kevin Campion on your side? Like, he's tough. 
it must have been great for the likes of the Ford pack, you know. Absolutely, he's probably the one uh, warrior that I we, out of that O two side that I see the most, and I and I you know I'm I'm always uh, catching up with him here on the Gold Coast. He's uh, mm-hmm. owns a cleaning business down here, so um, yeah, I uh, I catch up with him great, and mate, he's. If when you when you he's one of those players when you look around the around the change room around the room and you see him over there and Stacey Jones if those two are in your side yeah. we were confident we can win the, any game yeah. so um you know that he's the type of player that you just look across and be, get the confidence that he's on your team and uh, yeah thank God he's on my team so um yeah like I said he's a champion of a bloke and he'll do anything for you he's a really nice bloke and um I keep in touch with him quite often to be honest with you oh that's awesome man. So 2003, you guys win close again, got all the way to the semifinals. Um, but what a season. You guys were pretty impressive. And Brent Webb came into the side as the starting fullback, and he really lit it up. And you guys, it seemed like business as usual. Warriors are going to go all the way this time. You've learned from last year, but just falling short. What was it like, you know, for the team that season and for yourself? Oh, same thing. I think... Um... I think uh, looking back on that 03 season, it's very tough to back up after a grand final win or loss. Um, so we were trying to be better. Um, I don't know if we got better. We just maintained it. And again, in this in that um, era, you know, there was a lot of sides that are even. Um, it could have go either way every single time, kind of thing. So um, to say, like you know, we we did we overachieved again. Um, you just, yeah, we didn't just get to that final hurdle, you know? Yeah, because you had some cracking playoff matches. Like, you smoked the Bulldogs, Francis Melly, five tries, hell of a game. But the one that I reckon goes under the radar again is the 17-16 victory against Canberra. Like, that was tough. And Canberra, you guys, yeah. You guys were behind, like, 10 nil or something. Right. No, I didn't. I wasn't playing there at that time. I'm not too sure. I might have had an injury at that stage. Okay. I'm not sure, but I didn't play in that Panthers semifinal. Yeah, yeah, that was tough. It was tough because I thought you guys, honestly, you're going to go all the way. But I think that was the <laughs> thing because you made the final the year before. looked like business as usual. Yeah, no, you guys were unbelievable, eh? Like, oh, it's like Sione Famolina and all these guys, all the ball skills. Did you guys, like, train like to, to play like that? What was the training style? Like, Daniel Anderson had you guys doing something special. Yeah, well, Daniel Anderson was a really good coach. He um he basically let those guys, the Ali Lautidis and the Sioni Farm Winners and that, just do their thing. Yeah. Um, they had their their attributes that were good. Even Ali Lautidi, you know, he um he was uncontainable, and um they uh, Daniel Anderson just had to kind of teach him when and where and how to do it, but just you know do it when at will whenever you want kind of thing. So we weren't afraid to. Uh, uh, throw the ball around. Yeah. Um, we just had to learn how to control the ball better. And, you know, we really focused hard on skills um, yeah. just because, you know, if there's going to be an offload in our own half, catch the bloody ball, don't do yeah. it. So it's not a risky offload. It's just an offload. So play on. Right. So um, I remember, yeah, we had a real good off season with like around the skill element of it and the offload and, you know, just sticking to your strengths basically. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that he never – Never once coached, um, you know, don't do that, Ali, or anything like that. It was always, you know, go play your footy. This is our game plan. How we get there, you know, who cares, you know? Okay. Oh, I thought it was amazing. Um, now, I've heard stories of the sandpit. I want to know, what's the sandpit? There's probably a lot of people who don't know, and I know you didn't enjoy it. What's the sandpit, and why do you hate it so much? Well, I have a, pho- not a phobia, but I have a big hatred for sand and I don't like it on my body. So, um, yeah, the sand pit was, um, it was a punishment kind of um, area when we weren't defending well as a team. Yeah. Uh, but it was also a, now they have the foam, all the foam uh, padding rooms and all the soft and stuff. So we used to just get in the sand. It was, um, it softened it up for you. So not, not you didn't get hurt as much, right. but you seemed to go harder and get hurt more. So it was a real catch 22. Uh, right. They they built a sandpit underneath the Southern stand at Ericsson were before they did all the renovations and um, it had like a nice little cover over it and everything like that. So uh, it was always looked after. And uh, yeah, you just basically got in there got three or four meters apart and then just rip shreds off, off each other so uh that was basically in a nutshell it's just tackle tech and you just flog each other and you couldn't get as fast a run up because you're on sand so wow. that was the uh behind the 
we'll go in the sand pit and make it a little bit easy for you, which it wasn't. And, um, yeah, the coaches just loved watching us go nuts and just smash each other in there. And one one memory, I was just telling this story to a couple of mates the other day. Um, there was a guy named Frank Paul Nuasala. Oh, I remember him. And also the late Sonny Fire. These kid, two kids were kind of 18, 17, 18 in the academy squad. Right. And they brought them in to train with us every other every other week. And uh, Frank Paul just absolutely flogged all us old blokes and just – that was hurting us, and we're like, mate, what are you doing? Calm down. And uh, yeah, we, he, we he just went hard, and that's just how we trained. And then yeah, he went on and done, you know done some amazing things in league as well. So, but yeah, the sandpit is definitely torture, and I don't wish any upon, upon anyone to go in it. <laughs> oh, you guys were pretty hard forward pack. So it didn't work because I I did I had something like um Daniel Anson said if you forwards didn't get suspended at least once a season, you weren't doing your job. Is that true? Absolutely, yeah. I had uh, Brian Smith tell me once, Mark, your job is to hurt people. Yeah. Um. So can you please start doing that? I'm like, oh, okay, Brian. Sorry, mate. But uh, but yeah, I uh, yeah. Back the games changed a little bit, and uh, my job was obviously to wear people down, um, and you know be a, an enforcer and yeah. also protect Stace in the halves. So the games changed a little bit in that aspect, but um, it's definitely um, it was definitely a tough job. And uh, yeah, but I enjoyed it. I wouldn't change a thing. Nice man. Okay, so two thousand and four, it didn't go well for the Warriors at all. Oh, I had season tickets too for the new East Stand, but it wasn't finished, so I had to sit on the other <laughs> side, watch you guys. I think you only got about six wins that year. Narrowly avoided the spoon by four and against. Uh, so what happened, man? Because because you sort of left that season. Ali left. Was there any in particular? I was gonna. Thing that you I was gonna. Play? I was gonna say I don't know where where they end up finishing because I was overseas. But uh, yeah, you know, I left. I left uh, with ten games to go. The reason I left was um, back then when you go when you got super when you want to go to the England Super League, you had to be to be a professional rugby league player. You have to have um, played seventy five percent of your of your NRL games most recently. And oh. as soon as you weren't playing, you were starting to lose your percentage. Of course. Um, yeah. So yeah, I had to leave then. At the time, I I got notified that England were interested because uh, Castleford Tigers were going to get relegated yep. um, and they needed some Aussie guys. One of their Aussie guys had just done his ACL, so his season was over, so they needed to replace an Aussie. So I I, I got notified that uh, maybe uh, there might be some blades over there and I was playing um, I was playing in, in, in Australia at uh, Newtown Jets because yes. I couldn't get a run. I, I was on the outer there at the Warriors. Wow. And um, yeah, there was a little bit of turmoil. Um, Ali Ali got his marching orders and he yeah. walked out of the club pretty much on the day. Yeah. Yeah, he got that he went crazy. in, had an interview, had a chat with um uh, um not Eric Watson, uh, Mick Watson, yep. the CEO at the time. And then Mick walks him out to the change rooms, he gets his stuff and walks out through our wait session. And we we're cool. all like, What is going on here? And then we all just thought, Oh, he's gotta to go to you know, go and have do something else. And then word got around he'd just been marched out of the club wow. and we we're all just like, What? what and then that was pretty you? much a there was a snowball effect after that, to be honest with you. Yeah. I I don't know if Daniel Anderson was told to leave or asked to leave or Daniel Anderson left. I really don't know his situation. Yeah. He went. Uh and I I, re- I think I was just after that. So yeah. um once he left, um, Kempy was in charge. Tony Kemp yes. took over the coaching role. And then um, I, I think the opportunity had come and I just went and had a chat with Kempy and said, mate, what's my chances of playing here? And he's like, not much. Uh, really? So I just said, okay, sweet as I'll take up this opportunity and go to England. So I had to kind of pack up a house and get over to England in within about 11 days or something before oh, um, before my visa was uh didn't work or something like that so it was all a bit of a snowball but yeah it was a tough year in uh 04 uh could i tell you what happened no not really they they tried to maybe you know go one better and try and change things up and it just yep. didn't work and didn't work. Um, I don't know if they were trying to be better and they put pressure on Ali or what it was but um yeah that was kind of the snowball effect after yeah. that Tough year after so much success, you know. So you you wind up at Castleford Tigers. What's the experience like going over to the UK and just trying something different? 
it was it was hectic. I uh, I'd never in my wildest dreams had even thought of the UK. To be honest with you, um, well, truth be known, if the crushes didn't fold, I would have been a one club man. I would I was never going to leave. Really? So I was very loyal in that aspect. So I um. When I went over to Castleford, I was like, wow. So I went over by myself. Uh, my wife stayed in um, in Australia at the time. And right. um, I was there for, a, I got over there during um, during summer where the sun didn't go down till 11 o'clock at night. Oh, you're kidding. So I'm like, um, what is going on here? I didn't, know, I didn't know nothing what was going on, like with how it all works. So I ended up having 10, seat, 10 games over there in in uh, at Castleford, trying right. to get him out of relegation. Mm -hmm. um, myself, Stephen Crouch. Uh, we went over there as these two Aussie guys trying to get him out of relegation. We won. Uh, we had to win seven of our last ten, and we ended up winning six of them. So, okay. uh, and they'd won one game in the first eighteen. So it oh, was okay. really, you know, it was uh, high pressure, high stakes because uh, they ended up getting relegated. That's why I went down to London. But um, right. it was uh, very close. We had to beat. Um, oh, I can't remember. We had to beat. Salford, let's say it was Salford, uh, but we also had to have Wakefield Trinity lose. So yeah. there was a few things that had to happen our right. way, and we ended up um, losing anyway. And then Wakefield won. So okay. um, it was a relegation. I had a really good time over in Castleford. It's a, just a you're in the boiler, mate. Uh, everyone in the the crowd know who you are. They yeah. you can't go shopping without them knowing who you are. Oh, well. you know, they're right in your grill. So um I went down to London and that no one knows who you are in London. Yeah, well, it's not uh, it's a big place down there. <laughs> so so uh what memories did you have from London and the UK? Was there any particular standout moments? Was London in the, the top flight like in first division? Yeah, I enjoyed my time at London. I just found that it was a little bit too tiered, the comp in, over in the uh, Super League. Yeah. Um, the, the top six, eight teams were very good, NRL yeah. quality, and then the bottom four to six teams were struggling, um, maybe average NRL team, uh, maybe reserve grade at best kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, but they were all scrapping. We had a really good time. I was living in London, obviously, and, uh, you know, you could get overseas to all the little places yeah. uh, uh, in your weekends off or whatever, so if you had a buy. So um, in that aspect, it was really good. I, I just um, – it was uh, really different. The off-season training was mm -hmm. in the winter. So you started training at minus six degrees, zero, wow. you know, um, you're, you're running around in mud um, with three layers of clothes on. And then awesome. by the end of the training session, you're in a shirt and shorts because you, <laughs> you, you, you gassed, you know. So yeah. um, just that aspect, you know, we're used to training in 40 degree heat here in Australia and you go yeah. over there and training in minus one or two. And Crazy. a couple of training sessions got cancelled because um, the ground was frozen. Wow. So we had to kind of wait an hour for it to thaw out, things like that. So Easy. those kind of things were all novelties. Yeah. Um, I remember my first, one of the first games I played for um, London Broncos, I it started snowing while we were while we were playing. So that was like, I'm just like, I remember sitting on the bench looking around going, oh, snow's falling. Uh, <laughs> and then the trainer says to me, it was actually Rowan Smith, Brian's son, yeah. was our assistant coach. He's like, yeah. get ready, you're ready to go. And I'm like, are you serious? It's no one, mate. So uh, we went out there. We played Wakefield Trinity, uh, yeah. and it was at Brentford, um, in at our home ground, and we won seventy two nil. Oh wow! Um, our, our goal kicker kicked twelve from twelve in the snow, and that was that was Paul Sykes. I remember that game pretty vividly. But again, I didn't get to appreciate the snow falling nah. <laughs> as a Aussie uh, down there in London. So, but yeah, I had plenty of really good times over there, and um, you know, again, get to see the world from over there as well. So. Yeah, that's really amazing, important. man. Good way to sort of finish off the career. Uh, you played in three different countries at that point. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Absolutely. Okay, so a few quick fan questions that we put out on the Facebooks and social medias today. Um, what was your favourite club to play for? So this is from Ashley Pope. Was it the Crushers, Eels or the Warriors? No, nah, definitely the Warriors, 100%. Yeah, I was there for five years. Um, very successful. The people there are amazing. And I, I've, I've married a Kiwi girl now as well. So I love the Kiwis over there and they've um, taken me in with open arms. And um, yeah, I, I'll get back to New Zealand as much as I can, whenever I can. So um, yeah, absolutely love the place. Lovely. Uh, okay. So from Tari Fionui, sorry if I pronounce that wrong. Uh, who do you revere as the toughest to tackle coming off the back fence? Um. Ruben Wiki was always the hardest for me. Um, 
he was definitely the. I went. I've I've been asked this question about a thousand times, but right. um, yeah, definitely Ruben Wiki. He was um, when you tackled him, he hurt you. When yep. he tackled you, he hurt you. So um, yeah, and then again, the obvious ones are the Webkeys and the Pedro Simon Receivers. Yes. You know, the Broncos, they just were relentless as well. So mm. there's plenty of players that you hated tackling, but um, Ruben Wiki definitely stands out. He ended up, he was a center, ended up in the front row, and he was yeah. so fast and powerful, it was ridiculous. And he's worse now. He's bloody bigger than he was when he played. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how good. Okay, so Troy Warner from the Paracave podcast, he wants to know more about the work you do uh, with the disabled sportsmen and women. What do you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how it all basically started, my daughter, I've got three daughters and my middle daughter's got cerebral palsy in a wheelchair, right. um, fully able body, uh, fully ably minded, but she's just um, confined to a wheelchair, obviously with the legs. So um being around that, and then um, I, I was doing a bit of caddying for a blind golfer as well. So um, between the two of those, during COVID, I'm like, I might as well just get involved in bloody disability stuff. So I became a support coordinator, um, a support worker, sorry. And um, I, I, work for, I got a job with CPL down here, and I basically motivate um, – athletes or even young people with a disability to get keep keep active you know so um don't worry about what you can't do it's more about what you can do and let's kind of roll with that so i, I got involved with that as much as i could um i've been running the big two sports kind of event stuff so i went into doing a little bit um, more activity with the with the um disability side of things um i now caddy for um got blind golfers so i'll travel around australia um, um caddying for those guys yeah. Uh, my fella at the moment's doing really well. Um, I coach the Titans disability side, so wow. um, I, I know I, I um, uh, what's his name, Craig uh, Wallace, Jared Wallace's dad. Uh, I, I've known Craig during the footy times, yep. and uh, he was uh, he contacted me and said, "Oh, I do some stuff at the Titans disability stuff. Are you interested to come and help?" And I'm like, "Hell yeah!" So I went down there and I kind of assist with uh, one of the sides there, and that's the most rewarding thing I've ever done is to see um, these young um, men with um, or men and women with disabilities um, having a crack at rugby league. It's just impossible to fathom kind of thing when you see them do it and it's so rewarding and I, I get out there and play as the able-bodied player sometimes so I just you know pass the ball to them and help tackle and stuff like that so and it's just uh, unbelievable so uh, along all those kind of lines yeah that's what I'm doing now I do a lot of the disability I just hosted a, a boxing event like I do the promotion of it and yeah. two uh, two clients from the footy actually jumped in the ring and had a fight oh, and uh, you know again they had no boxing experience whatsoever I just said, let's have a go. What's to, what do you got to lose? Exactly. And they really put on a really good show and had fun. Stepped out of their comfort zone, and I and I've opened them up now to being fit, healthy, and trying to you know do other things and challenge themselves. So you know, I love doing that, and that's the most rewarding part of my job at the moment. That has to inspire you, like every day, just to get out of bed and go. Every day, it's just, they never cease to amaze me, mate. Every single day, that it's crazy. So awesome. Um, okay, uh, Joey from the Ruck Infringement Podcast just wants to say, Dukes. <laughs> I assume you know what that means. That's all. <laughs> How you going, Joey? Okay. Uh, okay, this one's really important. You're not allowed to get this wrong. It's from Rach Dempster, Tukey. <laughs> no. Do you credit your I wife? Think I know her. She's looking at me. <laughs> Do you credit your wife's cooking for looking slimmer these days? So answer very carefully. <laughs> I'll answer very diplomatically. She's going to throw something at me if it's wrong, but um, it's her lack of cooking actually that uh, has slimmed <laughs> me down. Uh, we, uh, yeah, no, she's, uh, yeah, I've been married to Rach now just over a year. We just celebrated our uh, anniversary, our first year anniversary, oh, and um, we're we're a pigeon pair to be honest with you. We um, we've been together now five years, and. Yeah. We uh we she absolutely loves rugby league and we oh, we girl. love the motor cars uh, the V eight supercars and that as well so we have uh very um you know the same interests and in, um yeah it's um but yeah her cooking is um very average and um <laughs> if I want anything cooked I have to do it myself <laughs> well, Hence, like I'm a, a bit smaller <laughs> <laughs> all right couple more we got Dean Clark who was the player you feared most during your career. Um, or well, the player I feared most, not because he was going to hurt me or anything. It was more jo Andrew Johns. He was a pain in my ass. 
he uh, he used to pick on me all the time. Uh, whenever I got tired, he'd let me know, and he'd you know he'd be sledging me. Um, he was he's the greatest player I've ever played against, and uh, he used to scare the shit out of me, to be honest. So uh, um, not for any reason that he's going to hurt me or anything, but he would he could smash me too. He was a yeah. he was a great defender, but um, yeah, Andrew Johns is the greatest player I've ever seen. Um, yeah. Closely followed by um, Jonathan Sim- um, Jonathan Thurston. So. That's an awesome answer. Okay, last one. Uh, who was the person you owe that gave you a kickstart to your career? Oh, it'd have to be Brian Edwards. Um, Brian Edwards is um, a really, really, really good friend of mine. Um, he was uh, the recruiting man for the Crushers at the time. He did his trade underneath um, the great Cyril Connell. Um, so yes. he, he's he been now recruiting, I reckon, for, for 40 years, uh, Brian. Um, he founded me um, way back in the day. Again, I was just a little roly-poly fat kid who, who could run a little bit and pass. And um, he, he actually saw well, you know, what I could do. And um, he was a big, big reason that I've gone on to where I am now. Obviously, my mum and my stepdad, um, you know, they did take me along. And I, I really think they living in Logan, obviously there's a lot of um, disruption and uh, you can uh, go down the wrong path right. very easily. But um, they, they, when I look back now, they kept me very busy um, and, you know, I love doing footy and if I wasn't doing footy, I was doing cricket. And if I wasn't there, I was right. little athletics or whatever. So they kept me busy and I, you know, kept me out of harm in other ways. Uh, and um, I, you know, I have to credit, to, um, especially like mum for, you know, you're doing that and leading me down that path. But um but yeah, Brian Edwards would be the most influential person. He he was the one who founded me. And it's funny, after I retired, I came back and I contacted Brian and he got me a job with the Canberra Raiders in the end. So oh, I was good. a recruitment man for the in the Canberra Raiders for eight years as well. So oh, wow. um yeah, he's been very influential in my life. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that was asked by Alicia Edwards. So sorry, Alicia, I forgot to mention your name there. So great question. Um, okay, so a big fan of mine, Alicia. I have to shout out to Alicia. How are you? <laughs> oh, awesome. I've got a few fun questions that I always ask uh, my guests on the show. Who's going to win the comp in twenty twenty four? Well, Warriors, of course, mate. Good answer. Who else? <laughs> I'll play Penrith in the final. <laughs> okay, what's your favorite TV show? My favourite TV show, well, me and the missus, we have a really good, uh, what would you call it? We play Coronation Street. Oh, everyone loves Coro. Coro. Good yeah, old we're on Coro. Coro but, she, uh, but BBL's getting a good flogging at the moment too, so she doesn't really like the cricket. But, um, yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm watching the cricket at the moment. Oh, good stuff, man. Okay, any sport, very... to be honest, any sport. Oh, you got to love sports, mate. Very last question. <laughs> If you were on death row, and this one's so appropriate for you, if you were on death row, what would your final meal be? My final meal. Your final wow. meal. Wow. I, I, I want to. I want to add to my final day of life. I would love to go have a game of golf in the morning. Yep. Go to bingo at night. <laughs> have a game of bingo, and then I'll finish with ice cream. Oh, any oh, kind of ice you. cream will do me. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, thank you so much, man. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, hearing about your career, getting to meet you. How good is that? Um, I'm sure everyone's enjoyed hearing all the little details and paths and journeys you've taken to become the amazing fan favourite you've been throughout your career. So thank you so much for your time, man. Oh, awesome, mate. An absolute pleasure. And I hope to see you all over there in New Zealand when we get over there. Um, I'm hoping to get over there for a couple of the games. So, yeah, come and say good day. Oh, good stuff, man. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for your questions for Mark Tukey. Um, uh, get amongst the social platforms. Uh, get on the Facebook group. It's growing like wildfire. Uh, point of difference rugby league. So I've been your host, Dave. This has been Back in the Day with Mark Tukey, and we'll see you guys next time for kickoff. Thanks, mate. Full time. <laughs>